Today on the Transplant Helper, we're going to be discussing one of those necessary evils post-heart transplant, which is the heart cast slash biopsy procedure, something that you're going to do over and over again, so you may as well understand it and be better prepared to endure it. Stay tuned. Hey folks, welcome to the Transplant Helper today. My name is Jim Merle. Today we're discussing that dreaded heart cat slash biopsy procedure that you're going to endure over and over and over and over and over again as a post-heart transplant patient. Now certainly you're blessed to have your new transplant and for the most part, most of the tests and procedures you're going to do post-transplant are much easier than anything you endured pre-transplant, so you're going to be grateful. However, there's one exception to the rule that oftentimes comes up and it is the heart cast slash biopsy procedure that you're going to be enduring on a regular basis. Now whether it be in the beginning stages where it's being done every week or as you're further and further out maybe even just once a year, you're going to be enduring this procedure most likely to some extent for the rest of your life. Now, whether you're a pre-transplant patient today and you clicked on this video because you're wondering what is the heart cath biopsy procedure like? Uh, what does it take to go through it? Is it really hard to do? Or whether you're a post-transplant patient like I am who've endured this thing over and over again, you've kind of been there and you're currently doing that, it's old hat. I'll assure you today, I'm going to try to give you some information to make things easier. And especially those of us who are post-transplant patients, if you'll stick away all the way to the very end of the video, I'm going to give you one tip, which I promise, promise, promise you will make the procedure much easier. So you'll want to stick around and get that bit of information. Now, if you've not already experienced the post-transplant heart cast slash biopsy procedure, I want to start out right now by basically describing the procedure as well as along the way giving you some tips that you need to know while you're enduring it anyway. That's for all of us and any of us things that we need to know. Now the heart cath and biopsy procedure is done as it is because they're testing and checking you for post heart transplant acute cellular rejection. The word acute doesn't mean it's cute because it's not, but they're checking you for that rejection that's kind of a sudden onset type rejection, something that's going to occur and most likely will, by the way, 80% of people endure some form of rejection within the first year of transplant. So don't be afraid if you hear the word rejection, it's not something that we're excited about, but yet it's something that most of us are going to have to endure. Now, whether that rejection comes as an R0, which is really no rejection, in an all or an R1, an R2, or an R3 on the most severe end of that range, it's something that we may have to endure. And I've already had a preceding program about understanding post-transplant rejection. I'll try to link to up here as well as in the show notes below if you want to go back and watch that at the end of the program. But that's neither here nor there for today. We're talking about the actual biopsy procedure itself. Now, the first thing that you're going to endure in the biopsy procedure, after you sign in, they call you to the back, they're going to take you back into the cath lab. Now the cath lab itself basically looks like a surgical operating room. They're going to carry you into that semi-sterile, it's not completely sterile like an operating room, but that semi-sterile environment, lay you out on a metal slab or a stainless steel table and begin the procedure. Now before they begin the procedure, there are a few things that you and I need to be aware of before they start it off. And the first thing is very simply that in most of these cases, especially when they're going through your neck or possibly through your groin, you're going to, you're not, I should say, not going to receive any form of general anesthesia. Now, I've had some in my life that came with that and that was awesome. That was wonderful and easy to do. But most of these post-transplant are not going to be done in the hospital. They're actually done in the back room of the cath lab at your clinic and so they come with a, a just a localized anesthetic not that general anesthesia. So basically just numbing of the area is about all you get. But one thing you need to know about that is that more times than not, if you will ask and that's the key if you will ask prior to the procedure the doctors are willing to give you some kind of a small sedative just to take the edge off now it really doesn't do a whole lot for pain but if you can take your mind off into la la land during this stressful and anxious filled procedure you're probably going to want to and i'll describe it right now and you'll understand why that is basically once they give you that generalized or local anesthetic and i'll add this tip to it you need to tell them if you're not numb enough so they can keep numbing you don't want this thing to start without that 
path. But once they get you numbed up, they're going to start the procedure basically by putting in what's known as a sheath. Now, the sheath basically is about the size of this ink pen, whether it be a, this is a paper made, I think, but whether it be a big paper made old fashioned ink pen, that's about the size of the sheath they're going to be putting into your neck, into the jugular or the carotid artery, whichever it is right here. And they're going to put that sheath in and then pass all the catheters, all the instruments, everything that they need through that sheath on inside of the heart walls, inside of the heart, and take some measurements. And then toward the end of that, in the biopsy part of that, they're actually going to take a little pincher, a grabber looking thing. I think it's got four prongs, if I can do that right. But they're going to take that and go into your heart and actually pull pieces from your heart that they will then later use, maybe four or five pieces that they'll later use to test for that sailor acute rejection or acute cellular rejection but nonetheless that's part of what's going to be done now someone immediately stops right there and says wait a minute are there risk to this procedure well there are there are some risks there's a very small risk of a little bit of infection at the site where they go in there's a small risk or i should say a likely uh risk that you're going to have some bruising maybe a little lump or some pain at the site for a, a few days or a week or so that's a part of it there's a small risk a very slight risk very very slight risk that you could be actually allergic to some of the dyes they're going to use uh, in the procedure because they've got to put some dye, inject some dye into your body to better see through some x-ray type machines where they're going with this. And then there's a very, 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 very small risk of what's called a perforation. A perforation is just what it sounds like. It's where they're passing the catheters in through your heart and oops, someone makes a mistake and it can actually perforate or punch a small tiny hole in your heart or maybe in one of the vessels as they go through. And by the way, if that happens, doctors go into panic mode. I've had that happen one time out of all the ones I've had, 40, 50 of these, and it happened one time and they go into panic mode. But if it's just a very, very small perforation, they're immediately going to panic start checking the pressures and there may not need to be anything done all the way up to if it's severe enough you're fixing to be opened up in a surgical uh, area you don't want that but that's just a very small chance of that and of course they'll tell you if you read your literature there's even the possibility of death but don't be afraid of that either this is just again part of the necessary evil and i wanted you to be aware of that now as far as the procedure goes now they've got the sheath in it's about the size of the zinc pen and they're going to start passing first of all the cath uh pressure checkers uh, i'm sorry i lost my term there but they're going to start uh, passing the catheters into the heart muscle and and getting the pressures the actual pressures of the squeezing of the heart they're going to be looking while they go in with this dye and the overhead x-ray type machines they're going to be looking for blockages and all sorts of things but when they get down to the actual biopsy part of this procedure again they're going in with that little four prong grabber and they start to pull those pieces of heart it's not a difficult thing as a matter of fact most of this procedure is painless if you got enough local anesthetic and maybe if you're in la la land but you will be feeling some pressure as well as maybe some pricking and, and that sort of thing and then there's the mental thing that goes along with this from both as i do oftentimes because my head's kind of turned to the left i look up at the screens up here and i see it going on and then I can also hear it. I can hear the, the catheters, especially that little grabber tube coming in and out of the sheath. And it kind of makes a little a slipping like a cable noise, a cable rubbing against something. It's, it's just eerie. But nonetheless, it's a necessary evil. You have to have it done. Now, once they go in and pull the biopsies out, four or five of those, whatever they choose to do, once they pull those biopsies out, generally within the first 24 hours or so, it'll be sent off to a lab, checked for any potential rejection, and you'll get the results results from your doctor as to you know what what occurred there whether you're in any form of rejection if any treatment is known to need to be done so that's that's basically what the procedure is about it's it's nerve-wracking but it's not that difficult now i will say this especially in the beginning like i was and like all of us are but i can remember when i was doing it um when they're going in and doing that every single week it seemed like that they would do it like on a Thursday. And, and of course, it'd leave this bruise and this pain and, you know, just, oh, like that. And by the time it finally felt better on Wednesday, it was time to have it done again the next Thursday. But as things space out to biweekly and monthly and, and 
and semi-annually and annually, it'll get a lot easier. So don't worry about that. Now, sometimes this procedure will be done through your groin, and they're doing that uh, along with the fact that they need to do both a left and a right heart cath, not just the right heart cath this direction. But again, they're going in and doing the biopsy through basically the same wounds. And these wounds are put in there, again, by as they cut a little small incision with the uh, scalpel, put the sheath in, run all these tools through, get it done, and hopefully you're in and out. And and usually they'll tell you, especially like with the neck, for example, that's the better one of the two if you can choose or have a choice. They basically give you about a one-hour window there where you have to just sit still and, and completely upright, and then you're on your way. And from that point, you just kind of treat things, you know, according to whatever they tell you, which is oftentimes not to drive for a day or two and certainly not to pick up any weight for a week or so. That's just what's left behind. Now, the, the one that goes through your groin, a little bit more difficult. They might have you to lay on your back for three, four, five hours and, again, take those same types of precautions, albeit I'm, I'm a little more afraid of that one than the other. Now, there is an alternative to this I'm not going to be discussing today, but I am going to be discussing on another program, which once it's put up and posted, I'll link it here in the corners as well in the show note, known as the Alamap procedure, and it's much less invasive, but it's not a complete replacement. It will replace some of your biopsies, but not all. It's a simple blood draw. If you want me to just tell you the little insider secret of it, that's what it is. And so if I had a choice between the Alamap and, and a, a heart cath test biopsy, I would want the Alamap as far as comfort goes, but the information they gain in the heart cath biopsy really is much more accurate. I'll mention that again in that later program. Now, I promised all of you post-transplant patients, those of us who have been there, done that, and by the way, any of you need this piece of advice, toward the end of this that I give you some information which will make the whole procedure a lot easier, much more comfortable, easier for the doctors to put, put forth and do, and easier to recover from. Here's what it is, very simply, and that is when they tell you your NPO, that is to go without food and water the night before from, say, maybe most likely midnight on if you're having your procedure done bright and early in the morning, you need to do that. Do exactly what they tell you. Don't go into the cath lab having ate or drank or they'll kick you out of there. But at the same time, I would encourage you to drink water. This just happens to be a cup I've got here because I'm sipping some of it. Drink water up until 11.59. Just stay up, miss a little sleep, whatever you have to do. The point I'm making is go into the cath lab very, very, very hydrated because if you're dehydrated, it's actually much more difficult for them to pass the catheters and all they need through those veins and vessels because they're not dilated. The more hydrated you are, the more dilated your veins and vessels are and the easier the procedure will be. Now, I've actually had friends that have gone in dehydrated to the point that they actually said, you know what, we can't even finish the procedure. We're going to send you out for an IV, get some hydration in you, and then bring you back again. And you certainly don't want that. You don't want to deal with this thing a day or two in a row. You want some time in between that. So go in as hydrated as you possibly can. So the day before, I encourage you to drink, drink, drink. And I've actually had an entire program I linked to up here and down below uh, where I've discussed that in the previous episode in a little bit more detail if you want to go back and watch that. Nonetheless, I appreciate you pausing today to join me on this program. I know it's been a little bit longer than maybe you hoped it would, but I hope I've given you some real information that you can go by. Again, number one, when you go in, ask for that um, uh, la la medicine, as I call it. Ask for that if you can, and then make sure you're hydrated. That's going to make things go a lot easier. I appreciate you watching today. If it's helped you in any way, how about going to like, subscribe, and share this program? And until next time, stay stronger, friends. <laughs>